Okay, it's quarter past, so I will begin. I think everyone here already has our order of service. If you're watching later and don't, you can download this from the Facebook page. We gather this morning as the Church of God, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. The seed sheds its husk and the day emerges, blinking in the spring light. I'm going to light my candle here. You may like to light a candle at home as well. As we cast off the shadows, may our spirit rise with the rising sun, alive and awake in the glowing air. Morning, Annette and Jonathan and Margaret and Janet. Just come to our Coventry Litany of Reconciliation which in the summer we're going to be saying weekly in the Bond Out Church. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So let us pray to God for the hatred which divides nation from nation, race from race, class from class. Forgive and heal. The covetous desires of people and nations to possess what is not their own. Forgive and heal. The greed which exploits the work of human hands and lays waste the earth. Forgive and heal. Our envy of the welfare and happiness of others. Forgive and heal. Our indifference to the plight of the imprisoned, the homeless, the refugee. Forgive and heal. The lust which dishonours the bodies of women, men and children. Forgive and heal. The pride which leads us to trust in ourselves and not in God. Forgive and heal. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Amen. So our psalm today is number 26 as we read our way through the Psalter. Vindicate me, O Lord. For I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in God without wavering. Prove me, O God, and try me. Test my heart and mind. For your steadfast love is before my eyes, and I walk in faithfulness to you. I do not sit with the worthless, nor do I consort with hypocrites. I hate the company of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. I wash my hands in innocence and go around your altar, O Lord, singing aloud a song of thanksgiving and telling all your wondrous deeds. O Lord, I love the house in which you dwell and the place where your glory abides. Do not sweep me away with the sinners, nor my life with the bloodthirsty, those in whose hands are evil devices and whose right hands are full of bribes. But as for me, I walk with integrity. Now I walk in my integrity. Redeem me and be gracious to me. My foot stands on level ground. In the great congregation, I will bless the Lord. It's a very interesting psalm um, for us to read as Christians because so many of the, um, the lines in there 
ring with such a different resonance um, when you come to it knowing the New Testament. I mean, that line, I wash my hands in innocence, um, just instantly, I think, for, you know, if you've, if you've been a Christian for any time, um, reminds you of Pontius Pilate washing his hands, uh, which, of course, is not at all the resonance it was intended to have uh, when it was written. <laughs> yes, I can see a couple of people saying, sounds a bit smug, not at all humble. Um, again, you know, this idea of saying, you know, I'm so holy uh, is something that as Christians we have been very conditioned against, haven't we? And there's quite a lot of bits in the in the Gospels where it's almost like Jesus is in, in deliberate argument with um, with this. And it begins and ends with that word integrity. Right? It does seem to me that integrity is something that is hugely important in, in kind of our political discourse nowadays. You know, what do we actually think of integrity? Do we think of integrity as a value anymore? Um, it's very smug, not very British to go on and on about your own integrity. Um, but actually, do we think that walking in integrity is virtuous? I don't think we do think that going on about how brilliant you are is, is particularly virtuous. We all we all react quite uh, quite violently against that. But I think the other thing it, it reading it with Christian eyes, which of you know, of course, we keep need to keep saying with the Psalms are not how they're written. Um, yes, absolutely. Rosalind pointing out the not sitting down with evildoers is one of those other bits where almost Jesus's actions seem to be in direct um, dialogue with this psalm. Um, just how difficult it is, you know, how is it possible to live with integrity? Is it possible to trust in the Lord without wavering? Is that, is that actually humanly possible for anybody? Um, my ste your steadfast love is before my eyes and I walk in faithfulness to you. I think we all know just how unlikely it is that any of us could ever say this truthfully. <laughs> Perhaps why it comes across very smug. It's like, really? Um, but is it meant to be somebody actually saying, look how brilliant I am? Or is it meant to be aspirational? And do we aspire to walking with integrity? I don't know. To what extent we um, we see this as aspirational is, is an interesting question, particularly in our, in our current political life. Anyway, let's move on to our reading from 1 Corinthians. And we're, we're missing out a little bit today. Generally, we've been reading all the way through 1 Corinthians, um, but we're just going to miss out the central section of the reading today. We're going to miss, we're, we're on chapter 11, starting at verse 17. And we're just going to miss out verses 23 to 26 because we're going to use those on Maundy Thursday. Um, so that's just the, the remembrance of the Last Supper. Um, and we'll, we will come back to that. But obviously in our discussion, we remember that that's there. So chapter 11, verse 17 to the end, but um, actually it's verses 17 to 22 and then 27 to 34. Now, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. And then there's the remembrance of the Last Supper, and he goes on. 
Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things, I will give you instructions when I come. Now, once again, this is um, one of those passages which uh, those of us who've been brought up in church, um, and particularly who've gone to fairly conservative type Bible studies, will have heard certain verses taken out of this and given as instructions. Um, so, for example, particularly, I know many people have heard, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Um, as laughing at Sally's line about Paul really knowing how to castigate people. Um, but I mean, a lot of people, particularly in the Catholic tradition, have really heard that as a, as a um, in a very threatening manner. You know, that somehow unless you're believing the right things about what the body and blood of Christ are in communion, um, then you're, you're condemned to hell. You know, some, some of you will have heard that or, or have heard of it. Um, but it, it seems very, very clear that this whole section it isn't so much about communion as we think of it now. Um, it, it seems fairly clear from, from Paul's letter here and from, uh, yes, yeah, so Kath's asking a question about this. So it seems fairly clear from this that what was happening was it wasn't like our communion now. There wasn't the kind of symbolic communion with some bread and some wine, which everyone then shares. It was more like a bring and share supper, but it wasn't a bring and share supper. It wasn't everyone bringing their food and putting it on the table um, and people sharing it. It had got to the point where people were effectively bringing their own picnics. And so some people hadn't got anything and some people were having a lavish feast. Um, you know, some people getting drunk, he says, you know. Some, some people have got their, their, their foie gras and prosecco um, and others have got absolutely nothing. And it becomes a question of showing off about I mean, food particularly then I mean to some extent now I think of how some of you will have gone to church buffets where it became very competitive how how nice the quiche that you brought was or something um so it had become something that people were showing off about and it had become something that going back to Paul's favorite theme throughout 1 Corinthians wasn't building up the body of Christ but was a further cause for division um and it's interesting because sometimes people who um, want to be critical of the church or who, who are often new Christians, and I remember feeling this myself when I first became a Christian, um, being a bit snide about, oh, not so much when I first became a Christian, when I wasn't really a Christian but had started going to church, I can remember being quite snide about the um, sort of rather pathetic small amount of bread. And thinking, why isn't this more lavish? Why is this such a tiny little dry crust of bread or a little wafer? You know, what's that got to do with eating and drinking and the fullness of God and so on? Um, and I think that does go back to, to this passage, actually in quite a helpful way. That it is um, a symbolic sharing. Um, not about having loads and loads of food. Um, but about everyone being equal. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why um, some people got very edgy and angry about... Um, it's one of the reasons behind the Protestant church being very insistent that everybody should receive both the bread and the wine. Um, and there was quite a lot of controversy about that before the first lockdown, when we went to just sharing bread uh, and not sharing the chalice, which we'd done again about 15 years ago um, in the swine flu um, scare uh, but but for people for whom it's really important that everybody shares everything actually going back to only the priest using the chalice was was you know brought back all sorts was, was quite triggering for many people um, 
So yes, the the ideal of everyone sharing and being aware. I was like, can't, can't believe that comment, Janet. That is astonishing. A deanery chapter lunch where two free tell a luxury happen and can't go on about it. I mean, oh, how could you do that? Um, yeah, so when we have a bring and share supper and the idea is everyone puts things on the table and you don't know who bought what, um, I, I find it, <laughs> one of my pet hates in, in churches is where, you know, you have a bring and share supper and you thank people for bringing things. But what I, what I loathe is when I've been to some where people have picked out certain things and gone, oh, and thank you so much to, uh, to Maureen for bringing her, her wonderful, you know, um, salmon side or something. Because um, it just feels really invidious to pick out particular, particular people. It's fine if somebody's done a lot of work organising it or something, but um, using food to show off just seems so, so wrong. Uh, and that's what this passage is about. It's not really, interestingly, um, about the theology of communion. And it seems to me that that's one of the, um, the key things here in terms of the way this has often been used about Eucharistic theology. Um, where is it? Chapter, verse 29. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body, eat and drink judgment against themselves. Now, I don't know about you, but I have heard that very often used, um, as I say, particularly in a, in a, uh, from a more Catholic and Anglo-Catholic point of view, um, to say that unless you have this particular Eucharistic theology of the real presence, then you're condemning yourself. Um, but yes, as, as Rosalind says, um, Paul is talking about the body of Christ, which is the community. Uh, it, if, you're, if you can't see what's going on around you and what's going to build up this community and this, this body, this corporate body, and corporate, of course, comes from the Latin word corpus, body, um, then, then what on earth are you doing? You know, you're, this isn't about God condemning you because you're thinking the wrong thing about something. It's about you're, you're just you're showing, you're demonstrating how much you don't understand what this is about. That, that's what Paul is saying. Um, and again, as Sally says, you know, he has a very good line in castigation. And he is, we need to remember, he is writing to a very specific group of people in a very specific context. Um, but yes, I, we read this, don't we, now? And, and just <laughs> with that sense of longing for how for gathering together and eating and drinking again, whether that's um, in terms of going to church for communion or simply gathering with people to to eat, you know, having friends around for dinner, going to, you know, a lot of people will have missed taking their mum out for a pub lunch on Sunday, that kind of thing. Um, I think this year has certainly made us realise in a very visceral way, we've, you know, we've always said how important eating and sharing together is um symbolically but uh, my goodness having had to not have it this year i think we, it, it really brings home just how important a thing it is doesn't it So let's move on to our prayers of intercession. We'll begin with keeping some silence together and um, do as you as you wish, add your prayers into the comments.
to pray for ourselves as the body of Christ here in this place and time. We pray for our church communities here in Liverpool and scattered around the country wherever you are. We pray for their building up even in this time of separation. We hold before you all the fears and hopes and dreams that we have for the future of your church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are hungry, for those who don't have homes to go to. Praying particularly today for the work of Micah Liverpool and the food banks that it runs at St Bride's and St Vincent's, for the volunteers, the staff and all those who have been making use of the food bank over this time. Pray for the many food pantries that are beginning or have begun over this pandemic time in churches and other community spaces around the city and around the country. For the work of feeding Liverpool and for systemic change so that in providing such help we don't simply end up being used by the government to prop up unjust systems. Help us in MICA and in all our other organisations to challenge the conditions that make these food banks and food pantries necessary whilst also being committed to providing them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Pray for all those people named in our comments. For all those in any kind of need, in body, mind or spirit. Those who are ill. Those who are bereaved. Those who are fearful. Those who are troubled in any way. We hold them before you, Lord, and ask for your healing and joy-giving and peace-bringing presence to bring shalom into all their situations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We look forward this week to gardening education activities starting back up again in St Michael's. We pray for all the various bits and pieces that we need to do to make the building ready to receive people again. Pray for those activities to be carried out safely. And we pray for the work of Face for Change all the staff and volunteers and those who will attend. We pray for the work of becoming an eco-diocese and eco-churches. We pray that as a, as a church, as a country and in the whole world, we may discern a better balance between our desires and our needs as human beings and the needs of the earth and discern a sustainable future. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. pray for all those who have died. Continue to remember Sarah Everard. For Liam's family. Bring them the joy of the resurrection through their pain. Amen. Jesus was praying in a certain place and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we for ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. Amen. Creator and healer, root of all goodness, working your Sabbath will in the chaos of our life. Teach us the insight that gives true judgment and praises you wherever you are found, making miracles from spit and mud. Through Jesus Christ, the Son of Earth. Amen. Let us keep alert, stand firm in our faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all that we do be done in love. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. May love be with all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Good to see you all and see you again tomorrow. Bye.